new every end of the year, beginning of the new year. No. His mercies are new January 1st. No. His mercies are new every morning. I'm telling you that we can have the mercy of God 24-7. That's what God wants. But somehow when we're entering into a new year, we begin to think, I wonder what God has for us this year. Even though we know in the Jewish calendar that was in September, but what does God have for us this year? And so we start thinking of New Year's resolutions. What are we going to be resolved that we're going to work at, that we're going to be better at this year than we were last year or the years before? Most people have, like, the number one is we're going to lose weight. We're going to be nicer people. We're going to love more. God makes his commands real easy. Here they are. Love me with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so I'm telling you, as we do these New Year's resolutions, I want us to do it God's way. Let's run the first video, please. This is New Year's resolutions for men on the street. Oh, it's a good one. What are my New Year's resolutions? To lose weight. Giving up caffeine. No smoking cigarettes. Getting a new job. Getting more in track with budget. Maybe be more considerate of others. Take better care of myself. Spend less money. Do a better job taking care of my family. Drink less coffee. <laughs> Go with the flow, I guess. Probably try to be a, a better Christian. So every year I usually resolve to make some, but then I don't. Well, I'm so old, I don't make them anymore. <laughs> I don't even know where the concept came from for making resolutions. It just seems kind of pointless. Can't break them if you don't make them. I think it's a new beginning. I think a lot of it helps us to look at centering ourselves again. If you want to change something, you just change it whenever. I mean, putting a date on it, I don't know if that really helps it. Maybe the resolution just sets a direction. Usually New Year's resolutions are probably only thought up in probably about a week. That's about two months, you just kind of give up on them. I just never, never really said any that really meant enough to me. I guess I didn't have the will to finish them. I think mostly it's like you just kind of forget and you have other things to do. It's just something that you know you're never going to achieve and so you say that as your New Year's resolution so you're not obligated to do it. I guess I really haven't had anything which is like important enough to me to or like actually stick to it. I think we just get bored easily. You stick to it for about two weeks and then life happens. How many of you actually made New Year's resolutions this year? Did anybody do There's a few people that did. Kind of they have done it before in the past and everything. And so I want us to look at the scripture in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 11. It says, we pray that you'll have strength to stick it out over the long haul. Not the grim strength, the gritting your teeth, but the glory strength that God gives. It's strength that endures and endurable and spills over into joy. And so God says, you know, here's the thing, is I don't want you to have the, I'm going to endure, I'm going to make it, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it. Because so many things are self-effort. It seems so, oh, I'm going to seek more, I'm going to pray more, I'm going to read more, and all that stuff is good. But a lot of times we're doing it by our own efforts, our own discipline, our own ability, so that we can have some pat on the back. And God says, I want it to be my glory strength that gets you through anything get you through every situation that we're going to encounter this year, it be his strength and his ability. I'm finding out something. I don't know if, if it's just because I've gotten older or I'm just, you know, I don't know what it is, but I'm finding out that the less I try to do and make something happen and the more I give it over to God, the more happens. That's wild. Doesn't make any sense. I've got to do. I've got to work. I've got to achieve. And yet God just keeps saying, rest in me, let go, and God's word that I really believe that he's really trying to get on the inside of us is to just be with him and let go and let him take care of our issues and take care of our situations. Like, I know we do such a great job at it anyway, and I know we've worked really hard and it's worked out so well for us. I don't know why he'd want us to cast the whole of our cares upon him. It says here in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 19, and so that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable, unlimited, surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe as demonstrating in the working of his mighty spirit? And so it's interesting because the faith that God wants us to have is not in our strength and our ability. I know that he has given us all strength and all ability, but our faith, our reliance has to be on that God begun this. God will see it to completion. I mean, isn't it amazing when we can finally take something out of our own hands give it over to him, that he actually does what he said he's going to do. 
we, we can try to work it and try to manipulate and try to do different things, and sometimes it works. It does. But I'm telling you what works 100% of the time. Reliance on his abilities and his powers and his power within me. In Psalm chapter 27 and verse 4, it says, I'm asking God for one thing and one thing only, to live with him in his house my whole long life. I'll contemplate his beauty. I'll study at his feet. What is the one thing? Because if I ask tonight, what's the one thing you want from God? Oh, I want open doors. What's the one thing you want from God? I want my bills paid. What's the one thing you want from God? Well, I want my relatives to come in. But the psalmist had it right when he said, this is one thing I want of God. I just want to be with him. I just want to talk with him. I just want to spend time with him. I mean, what did Jesus do? He would go for a whole night, not in prayer request, but just spending time with the Father. One of the times that Heidi Baker was here, she said, you know, when I'm uh, in Mozambique, she said, there's so much coming at me, so many people, so many need. She said that I actually go in the water and put my head down, and that's my alone time with God. And I thought, that's incredible. But the alone time with God really does make a difference. It really is how we ease into something. And I'm not talking about straining, come on, we've got to spend more time. Let's do one hour every day, wake up at six. And it always is some horrible thing that you have to do. I've got to wake up at four and do it then. I'm telling you that God just wants us to be eased in our relationship. I don't have to sit down with Wyatt and say, at this time we're going to meet together and that's when my attention... No, we get to be together. And God wants us in fellowship and understanding that he's not putting any requirements on us. You know, this is weird. When it talks about grace, it says, and the word grace is karis, it means freely given by the bestower to the receiver, never expecting a return. Now, I understand God not expecting a return from somebody on the street, somebody that doesn't know him. But after you've been in Christ, you need to be showing some things. You need to be doing some things. So it's a grace that's for one thing for people that are not in Christ to come to Christ and then new Christians. And then there's a different kind of grace for us that are mature in Christ. I don't know what to do with never expecting a return. I really don't. I don't know how to receive that kind of grace because I'll sow into something, but I'm expecting something back. Even if my love in relationships, when somebody does me in, my mind thinks, after all I, oh my goodness. So I was doing it so I could achieve a certain result or a certain feeling or a certain commitment. I wasn't freely loving. But what do you do with a God? who so freely loves us that he never expects a return. That's really hard for us to receive. And so Martha, and we know the story, but let's look at it in the message. I like the way it puts it out there. Luke 10, verse 38. They continued their travel, and Jesus entered a village, and a woman by the name of Martha welcomed him and made him feel quite at home. She had a sister, Mary, who sat before the master, hanging on every word he said. But Martha was pulling away as all she had to do in the kitchen. Later she stepped in, interrupted him. Master, don't you care that my sister has abandoned the kitchen to me? Tell her to lend me a hand. Now, first of all, this is weird. She meets Jesus on the road, and instead of asking her sister to help, she has to go because she needs something here. She needs Jesus to recognize, I am doing. I'm the one who's doing, and she's not doing. You do something about it. But that's not what this is about. In verse 41, the master said, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. The only thing that is essential, and Mary has chosen it, it's the main course and won't be taken from her. So this should tell us that that means we never do anything. No. He said, this is the main thing. I am the main course. You're out there trying to make some dinner that I'll be impressed with, And you want everybody doing that so that I'll be served that way. But what I really want is not you doing for me, you receiving from me. Now, how do we do that in Christianity? We're doers. The more you do, the better we are. But all of a sudden, the Father says, I've sent you a gift, a gift of my son. And Jesus says, I want you to partake of me. I know you're getting yourself all worked up about all the things that we need to do. But God promises something. That if we go after him, everything else is going to line up. But we've tried, like the Tower of Babel, they tried to get up to him by doing their thing so they could get up to him. He was already with them, and they just needed to receive with him. In Romans chapter 11 and verse 33, have you ever come on anything quite like this this extravagant generosity of God, this deep, deep wisdom? 
It's far over our heads. We'll never figure it out. Is there anyone around who can explain God? Anyone smart enough to tell him what to do? Anyone who has done such a huge favor for God that he has to ask his advice? Everything comes from him. Everything happens through him. Everything ends up in him. Always glory, always praise. Yes, yes, yes. So I know it's hard for us to imagine that God isn't relying and needing us to do anything. But what God is saying is everything started in me, everything is in me, and everything will end up in me. So if we want true life, what do we do? We go after the everything one who is Christ Jesus. It goes on now. You know, we break things up into chapters, and it's easier for us to say go to Romans 11, verse such and such, but it was not meant, it was not written, broken up in chapters. So here God is saying, I want you to understand that I don't owe man anything, that all things are from me, and then for some reason the chapter ends, but it shouldn't have. He says everything always ends up in him, always glory, always praise, Romans 12, 1. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embrace what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture always uh, around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, especially as I have the responsibilities in relation to you, living then, not as every one of you does in pure, living as every one of you does in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it to you. This only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by what we are and what we do for him. Oh, all of a sudden this whole Romans chapter 12 has had a change. Because before we'd say, and do not be transformed to this world. And yes, that's true. But he gave us the ability why we're not to be looking at the world and being one with the world. He says, because I have begun everything. And I'm the one who you can depend on. And I want to tell you what real life is. Not you doing, but you receiving. I mean, could you imagine getting our identity by what God does for us? Not by what we do for him? That's hard. Because we get our identity by what we do and what we accomplish and God says, here's what I want you to get your identity from, from what I have done for you and who I am, and that I bring out the best in you. I love that sentence. It says, the way we understand ourselves, you know, sometimes I don't understand me at all. It's like, why did I act that way? I don't know. It's probably something my mom did to me and it triggered and we go through all the different things. But really, honestly, the way to understand ourselves is by what God is and what he does for us. So what is God? And what does he do for you? Oh, he's love? Oh, well, now I understand me. I'm love. Well, what does he do for me? He loves me. He helps me. He heals me. He takes care of me. He rescues me. And when I understand him and what he does for me, then I understand who I am. Who am I? I'm the apple of his eye. Who am I? I'm the one who his heart is filled with. Who am I? I'm the one who's God. God has his mind filled with me. That's who I am. Not because I did this and I did that, and I'd love to list my accomplishments. I like how Paul says, I've done more than all of you. And then he just stops and says, ah, yeah, it wasn't me. It was a grace inside me. Anything we do, we've been empowered by God to do. And it's not that we should look at that and say, now I have arrived. We've arrived because he made us there. He brought it. It says the world brings us down to them, but God brings out the best in us and brings us up seated in heavenly places with him. What if we started really understanding? He loves me no matter what. What if we started really understanding I can be around him without having to perform for him? You know, Paul says this sentence that really is crazy in my head. He said, I'm no longer driven 
to do anything for you, or I am not driven to impress God. Well, I kind of want to impress you, <laughs> but I'm not even driven to impress God. That's pretty incredible. So this is uh, the man that comes to the disciples with his child that throws himself in the water and the fire, and the disciples can't cast the devil out of him, and Jesus tells them it's because of your unbelief. But the man comes to Jesus in Mark chapter 9 and verse 21, and Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has this been going on? Ever since he was a little boy. Many times he pitches into the fire or the river to do away with him. If you can do anything, have a heart to help us. Jesus said, if? There are no ifs among believers. Anything can happen. He realized Jesus is saying, you can't say if you're willing, if I've done enough things, if this will happen. He says, there's no ifs in you. Anything can happen. How much did this man earn the love of the Father, love of Jesus? How much did he give into the ministry that he could ask such a thing for his son to be delivered? He didn't. He just came. And Jesus said, listen, there's no ifs. So many times people would approach Jesus like, if you would. Remember the man with leprosy? If you're willing, I would be, this would be fine with me. If you're willing. And Jesus, if he's willing... I'm telling you tonight something. God's willing for every one of us. Loves every one of us and is willing to pour out everything that he is. And all we have to do is have faith and receive it. That's right. How tough is that? He gives us the faith. Yeah, the faith of the Son of God. How tough is this? I love when God talks about faith. He said, it's like a mustard seed. And we try to make this huge thing over it. And he says, have faith like a child. We try to make it so hard and so tough. He says, I've given you the very faith of the Son of God who loved you and gave himself up for you. In Psalm 18 and verse 30, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tested and tried. He is a shield to all those who take refuge and put trust in him. God isn't asking of us to do all these things. He's asking us, do you trust me? When Jesus comes back, he's coming back not to look at our accomplishments, but he's coming back to see if we have faith. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find us that trust him, that receive from him more than we try to do for him? Psalm 18, verse 30 in the message. What a God! His road stretches straight and smooth. Every God direction is road tested. Every run, everyone who runs towards him makes it. Hey, here's a good promise for us. Run towards God, and guess what? We make it. Wondering if you're going to make it? Oh, I just I just wonder if the last days, how they're going to be. Or people that say, I just wonder if you're going to finish well. You're going to finish well? Why? Because the God of the angel armies lives on the inside of you. It's the same thing when the disciples were saying, don't you care that we perish? Why well, think Jesus would care that they perished on the boat? Because he was on the boat too. Don't you care, Jesus, that we're going through all these things? Yeah. Because guess where he lives? Inside you. Your success in the mind of the Father has already happened, and he wants it for you far greater than you want it for yourself. God wants us to make it. And he says, and here's how. Come towards me. Psalm 37 and verse 34. Wait and expect the Lord. Keep and heed his ways, and he will exalt you, and you'll inherit the land. In the end, when the wicked are cut off, you'll see it. He says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek, aim at, strive after, first of all, his kingdom, his righteousness, his way of doing things, and all these things taken together will be given to you besides. I like it in the message. Seep your life in God reality. God's initiatives, God's provisions, don't worry about missing out. You'll find your everyday human concerns will be met. Come on, look at how the prayers are. That this month our rent could be made, Father. Father that we would have enough. And we've been so used to Christians just barely getting by in every area. Here a blessing, there a blessing, everywhere a little blessing, but that's not the way it is. God says, I poured out every spirit-given blessing upon you. And I'm telling you, you're not going to worry about your everyday concerns. And every person that you and I come in contact with, they're worried about their everyday concerns. How long are we going to live? What are we going to, are we going to have enough? Are we going to have struggles? You know, I was listening to somebody talk the other day, and they said, here's what life is. You work real hard. You get real tired. 
You struggle real much, and then you die. And I thought, hallelujah, praise be unto God, amen, amen, amen. But that really is how so many look at life. But God's saying something different. He's saying, look, you seek me and you'll be fulfilled. Come after me and you'll make it. And your everyday things, your everyday human concerns will be met. It says in Amos chapter 9 and verse 13, yes, indeed, it won't be long now, God's decree. Things are going to happen so fast your head will swim. One thing fast on the heels of another. You won't be able to keep up. Everything will be happening at once, and everywhere you look, blessings. Blessings like wine pouring off the mountain and the hills. See, we, we, we don't even talk about scriptures like this because we're struggling Christians. We're just believing God to just get by. If I could just get by, and he says, no, this isn't what I want. I want you to see blessing upon blessing upon blessing. I want it to come one right after the other so fast. This is the will of God. It is the will of God. But we're sometimes afraid to get our hopes up because, man, if we can just get by, it'll be fine. In Psalm 4 and verse 8, he says, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you, O Lord, make me dwell in safety and confident trust. I want you to see something about the scriptures that I'm reading. It never has the requirement if you do this. When you do, when you accomplish, it always is, he makes me both lie down and sleep and rest and trust in him. He's the one who provides my everyday needs. It's him. God wants our focus back on him. In Psalm 22 and verse 9, And to think you were a midwife at my birth, setting me at my mother's breast. When I left the womb, you cradled me. Since the moment of my birth, you've been my God. Do you know that? That before your parents ever got together, God thought of you, had a plan for you. And God says, I've been with you every moment of your life. Isn't that wild? We don't ever have to be alone. God's with us every moment of our life. Not just when we've been nice, but even when we've been naughty. He's with us every moment of our life. He says in, so in Proverbs 3, verse 5, lean, not, lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind. And do not rely on your own insight or understanding. So what's my job? My job is to trust him and to lean upon him and to just, shoo. I love it when big things are happening in my life, big things in my mind, I'm thinking, well, how's this going to happen? How's that going to happen? And God says, what am I saying? Oh, what? I know you're saying it'll turn out fine, but look at what I have to go. Are you sure? Do you believe Jesus is the son of God? Okay, so this is you. Okay. And you're sure. Okay. So why am I bugged about this? And then I'll go on, everything will be nice, and then praise him. Rip, 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 rip. Body, do you remember what I said? Yeah, you said it. Okay. You said it'll be okay. Tell you, what if tonight we really could let go of every offense, of every hurt, of every worry? <laughs> what if we really could do that tonight? Let go of it. Be happy. Don't worry. Be happy. What if we really could do that tonight? What if tonight those things that keep me, you could finally just know. I believe you, and I believe what you say. I think that's kind of his goal for this New Year's. Psalm 25 and verse 20. Let's go to that one. Oh, keep me, Lord. Deliver me. Let me not be ashamed or disappointed, for my trust and my refuge are in you. In the Message Bible, it says, keep watch over me. Keep me out of trouble. Don't let me down. When I run to you, I want to be kept out of trouble. I find myself in a lot of trouble sometimes. I'll tell you what mostly my trouble is in my mind. What if this happens? What if that happens? I should have said this. I can't believe they did it. Why are they? And God says, trust me, I'm going to keep you out of trouble. Psalm 37 and verse 3, trust, lean on, rely, and be confident in the Lord and do good. So shall you dwell in the land and feed, secure, feed surely on his faithfulness, and truly you shall be fed. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires, the secret petitions of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Roll, repose each care of your load on him. Trust, lean on, rely and be confident also in him, and he will bring it to pass. This is God. This is God. He says in Psalm 37, 3 in the message, it says, Get insurance with God and do a good deed. Settle down. Stick to your last. The, keep company with God. Get in on the best. Open up before God. 
keep nothing back, and he'll do, he'll do whatever needs to be done. Opening up to God. See, we think that we have to have the, oh, I praise you. Oh, thank you, dear. Oh, Lord, you, he said, just open up to me. He wants you to be a friend with him. God, I'm struggling with these things. He says, yeah, I understand. You know, I could take care of that in a second. Yeah, but if you will, if, there's no ifs among you, it'll be done. It says in 2 Corinthians 121, but it's God who confirms and makes us steadfast. No, it's me by how I read. How much I study and how much I pray, I'm the one who keeps me steadfast. Go ahead and ask me. I'll tell you all the works I do for God. Oh, oh, but the scriptures say, and he. It is God who confirms and makes us steadfast and establishes us in joint fellowship with you in Christ, has consecrated, that means to set apart, has anointed us in doing us with gifts of the Holy Spirit. In the Message Bible, God affirms us makes such a sure thing in Christ, putting his yes within us. Oh, so what do I have to do with all this? Just trust me. Just believe me. 1 Corinthians 1a, and he will establish you and keep you to the end, keep you steadfast and give you strength, guarantee your vindication. He'll be your warrant against all accusation and indictment so that you will be guiltless, irreproachable on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We must have a mistranslation here because it says he will establish you and keep you to the end and keep you steadfast. Give you strength and guarantee your vindication. No, I'm to keep on keeping on. I'm on this road and I'm to do it. But according to the Bible, he says, I'll do it for you. I'm going to keep you. I'm your vindication. I'm going to keep you strong. I'm going to make sure you make it. It's going to be okay. You know, you just have to put yourself in a position. The best analogy, the best thing we can think of is like a parent and their child. And I'm telling you something, when Jeremy knows that he's going out to eat, he doesn't think, I wonder if I have the credit card to go with that. I wonder if I have gas in the car. I wonder when I get there if I'm going to be able to afford what I want to on the menu if I have to get left. No, he's taken care of. Mom and dad have taken care of it. And how would mom and dad feel if he was worried all the time? They'd keep having to convince him, just trust us. It's okay. You don't even have a job. It's going to be fine, okay? It's going to be okay. And we're hoping he gets a job soon. But that's, you know, he's eight years old, so it hasn't worked out for us so far. Psalm 56, 11. In God I have put my trust and confidence and reliance. I will not be afraid not be afraid. I don't want to go to the video, so let's keep going. In Psalm 62 and verse 8, it says, Trust him, lean, and rely, and have confidence in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us, a fortress, a high tower. Say law, pause, and calmly think of that. Now, why would he have to say, think about this? Because we're always thinking of ways to make ourselves safe and secure and to make sure we have the finances for the future and to make sure that we have everything, all our ducks and everything lined up. And God says, here's what I want from you. Trust in me. Let me take care of you. Trust in me and let me do it for you. In the Message Bible, Psalm 62 and verse 8. So trust him absolutely, people. Lay your lives on the line for him. God is a safe place to be. I I think in any relationship that you and I have, one of the key factors is 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 it safe? Am I safe with you? Am I safe to say the things that I want to say without boom, judgment time? Relationships, they should be safe. And God says, I want you to pour out all you have to me so that I can judge you, condemn you, and tell you where you're wrong, and tell you why you're not being blessed. No. He says, pour out your heart to me. I'm safe now. God's safe. He knows you're going through this stuff anyway, so why are we pretending like we're not? He's safe. And we can talk to him, and he protects us. And saves us. I like Psalm 91, starting with verse 2. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God. On him I lean and rely. In him I confidently trust. For then he'll deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. Then he'll cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you shall trust and find refuge. His truth and his faithfulness are a shield and a buckler. In the Message Bible, say this. God, you're my refuge. I trust in you, and I'm safe. That's right. He rescues you from hidden traps, shields you from deadly hazards. His huge outstretched arms protect you. 
Under them, you're perfectly safe. His arms fend off all harm. Why do you think he wants us to come to him? So he can harm us, so he can tell us what to do, so he can make sure that we're doing everything. He wants us to come to him so he can protect us. He wants us to be there so that we can feel who we really are and see what he's done for us so we can know who we really are. In Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 2, Behold, God, my salvation, I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. He says, I'm trusting you. I'm not afraid. Trust God. Come on, Claudia, trust me. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to take care of my own self. I don't have to take care of me. I'm glad for that. I can take myself out of my own keeping, and I can trust him that I'll finish well. That we'll continue to go from glory to glory. You know, when it says that we are to seek him, that he may be found, we struggle with that. We think, I've got to seek and seek and seek and seek. But it's that he may be found. It's like I say, come on in the door and you'll be in the church. And you keep coming in the door, coming in the door, coming in the door, coming in the door. Well, come in the door and here's the church. Seek and we get to find him. It's not a struggle. It's that we do this and we, we've already been found by him. He's already found us and we've already found him. And we trust him. It says to have faith just like a grain of mustard seed and we can say to the mountain. He says don't doubt what you've seen done to this fig tree, you'll be able to do all that stuff and move mountains. Jesus told us that he had an absolute commitment to his father. I don't do what I want to do. I only do what he's doing. I don't say what I want to say. I say what he's saying. That's the fellowship that God's looking for in this time, in this year. We know that it's not by works of the law that we're set right before God. It's by what he's done for us. I like this. Go to Galatians 2.20, Jewel, if you will. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. In him I share his crucifixion. It's no longer I who live, but Christ the Messiah lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in, by adherence to, reliance on, and complete trust in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Now look at it in the message. This is a scripture I was talking about earlier. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself so completely with him. Indeed, I've been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It's no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. I'm no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. And the life you see me living is not mine, but is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. He's writing to the Galatians, convincing them that grace is the only way That faith, believing God, is the only way. That it's not by what they do and what they achieve and what they accomplish. And he says, listen, I'm not driven to impress you. I'm not driven to impress God. I'm not going to try to show you how righteous I am. Because I'm no longer central. But I am now crucified with him. And it's not me who lives, but it's Christ. Now, if it's truly you who don't live anymore, but it's Christ, then what are you worried about? Would you believe that Christ is going to make it through anything? He really will. The living Son of God will make it through anything. We know this. But it's the living Son of God who is inside us so that we become more than conquerors. So that whatever we put our hand to will prosper. We start getting concerned when we're not seeing it happening. But God says, listen, trust in me, and you'll have blessing upon blessing. Trust in me, and it'll come so fast your heads will spin. This is what God says. Let's see where I want to go here for a second. 2 Timothy 1, verse 5. This is when Paul is talking to Timothy, and he says, I'm calling up memories of your sincere, unqualified faith and the leaning of your entire personality on God in Christ and absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness. The faith that first lived permanently in the heart of your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, is now, I am fully persuaded, dwells in you also. I'm fully persuaded of something of us. The same faith that dwelled in Jesus dwells in us. When the psalmist, when we, cry, when we talked about it right at the first, when the psalmist cried out that I could just dwell in your house and gaze upon your beauty. When, God, when Jesus said, Martha has chosen the better portion, she has made me the main thing. 
and has listened to me, has dwelled listening to me. That word dwell is an interesting word. It actually means to covenant like in a marriage. To covenant to be together on everything in every decision. In 2015, God wants us to dwell with him, to be in the covenant with him, that every decision, everything that we do, you're not excluded. He's included in everything. The same faith that dwelled in Paul, the same faith that dwelled in Abraham, the same faith that dwelled in Jesus dwells in us. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 39, our way is not that of those who draw back to eternal misery, perdition, and are utterly destroyed, but we are of those who believe, who cleave to, trust, and rely on God through Jesus Christ the Messiah, and by faith preserve the soul. Look at it in the message, Hebrews 10, 39. But we're not quitters who lose out. Oh, no, we'll stay with it and survive trusting all the way. We'll stay with it. This is good news. This is good news. We'll stay with it. He begun a good work. He'll see it to complete. We'll stay with it. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Yeah, but I've lost so much time. It doesn't matter. You're going to make it. He said so. He promised us this. And he says, I just want to be around you. I just want to hang around you. Not to judge or condemn, but to show you exactly the relationship that I've created. First John 3 and verse 23. And this is his orders, his command, his injunction, that we should believe. Put our, put, believe in, put our faith in, trust in, adhere to, rely on the name of his son, Jesus, the Messiah, and that we should love one another just as he has commanded us in the Message Bible. Again, this is God's command, to believe in his personally named son, Jesus Christ, and he told us to love each other in line with the original command. Came to Jesus. Come on, Jesus. We've seen you do all these miracles. We've seen all these things happen. You've done so much for us. And we understood it was by grace, but now we're been walking with you for three years and now we know that there's some great thing that we could do to please you what could we do you want us to to go into a town and call judgment you want us to go into a town and call mercy what do you want and he says this is the one thing that god requires of you that you believe upon him and the son who he sent his command hasn't changed love god with all our heart mind and soul and our neighbors ourselves and believe him and the son that he sent It hasn't changed, but we're still looking for what's our resolution for this year. Well, maybe we should look at God's resolution. Run the video, and Mary, get ready. Every January, millions of people make resolutions. A third of these resolutions are abandoned within two weeks. More than half are abandoned in six months. Well, we made it a little time. Maybe this year, the best resolution is to focus on God's resolutions. before time begun and good for all eternity he is resolved to never leave you or forsake you he is resolved to guide you and direct you He is resolved to give you hope and a future. He is resolved to meet all your needs according to his glorious riches. He is resolved to pick you up every time you fall. He is resolved to finish the work that he begun in you. 
He is resolved. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? He's resolved. He's resolved to take care and be watchful over his word to perform it. He's resolved that there is not one thing too difficult for him and too difficult for us. He's resolved that he is the head and that he is above and that he is Lord God Almighty and therefore he has made us the head and he has made us joint heirs with him. And he's resolved that you're his beloved and he is yours. And he has resolved that he loves you with all that he is and he promises that everything will turn out according to uh, he has promised. He is resolved that you and I will see length of days. He is resolved that we will be the fulfillment of every promise that he has given us and that he has given to the world. He is resolved that we will be poured out. He is resolved that we will be in relationship with him. He is resolved that he is faithful. And he is resolved that he has made you in his very image. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your resolutions that are always kept. Your word that cannot lie in any way. Your word that is alive and full of power. And so, Father, tonight we want to do what you ask for our resolution. We resolve to trust you. And to take ourselves out of our keeping and to put ourselves into your keeping. And we resolve that our life is not our own, that we're bought with a price and we're yours. And we thank you for taking care of us. And I want you to take a moment, everything that you've been carrying, that load, give it over to him. Take some time. If there's somebody that's been bugging the heck out of you, give it over to God. Somebody that you're having trouble forgiving, give it over to God. Something that you can't see where God has not acted, you feel foolish in an area because you don't feel like God has acted, give it over to him. And release him. And rest in him. And be resolved that we will trust him. That we will have absolute faith in him. And that we will rest in him. Can we do that tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Mary, whenever you're ready. I think that this maybe goes with the word that you heard tonight. Um, during praise and worship, I heard, I believe I heard the Lord say that the cloud was moving. And I, I know what that refers to. I'm, I'm aware of the scripture in the Old Testament where the children of Israel were led by a cloud. And um, all of a sudden, I got a picture in my heart of what that cloud looked like. And I guess in my imagination, I always thought, you know, a nice fluffy cloud led them. But the Lord showed me a huge cloud because it had to be huge to cover them and keep them out of the sun because there were so many of them. And it was very much like the song we, we sang. It was filled with thunders and lightnings and rainbows and colors and God's glory because it was, in essence, the manifested presence of God. So they were being asked to keep moving and to move past some things that they had known and been familiar with, and without God's manifested presence, it would have been impossible for them to do that. But he was showing them in a tangible way that when he moved, they could move right with him because his presence was right there. So tonight, because we have a new year, God is telling us that we're going to move, not necessarily from this physical building. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking we're going to move into some new thing. But we're not going to move into them by ourselves. We're going to move into them and move 
with God in them because his manifested tangible presence will be there with us. And that makes it safe. So some unusual things are going to happen in this next series of years. And they will be things and sights you've never seen before. And some of those sights will make you feel strange. But as long as the manifest presence of God is with you, then you can be safe because you can trust God. And he will make his ways known to you in a way that you cannot uh, deny. Do you believe that? And so the cloud is moving, and we're going to move to, we're going to move into some brand new things, some brand new, however God sees fit to define them, we're moving. And so don't be afraid. It's going to be good. It's going to be better than good. It's going to be wonderful. And the worst thing that you could do, uh, uh, it's what's just kind of coming to me, the worst thing you could do is if, if in reality you lived in a house and you were moving to a new house, at night you wouldn't go back to your old house to sleep, would you? You would, you, you turned the lights off there and, and you've moved into something new so you don't keep going back. Don't go back. Let God take you from one degree of glory to another. But the cloud is moving. We're going to move right along with him. And it's going to be, Patty spoke tonight about extending your sphere of influence in essence. She's talking about stretching out to the left and to the right. And that's a good picture of what God's talking about in the years to come. So I hope you could kind of, I never thought of a cloud like that before. I just thought of this little fluffy cloud that moved. But no. <laughs> it was a great big old cloud. Because <laughs> God was manifesting himself through that cloud. And they were not on that journey by themselves, not for one moment. Thank you, Jesus. That's good news. So trust God, just like you heard in the message. That's the most important thing you could do for 2015. It really is. God knows what to do. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, Terja, stand up. And then I'm going to give Lala a word, because she told me that in all the years she went here, she did not get a word. And I said to myself, you know, the next time she comes, Lord, yeah. So it's, we're going to do that for sure. I'm, I just, I saw something in the script for you, and I want to speak it. I saw not a redo button, but a reset button. In 2015, God is resetting things for you. And by resetting, he doesn't even mean redo. I want you to understand what he's saying. Because some of the situations and circumstances, you don't have to do them over again because he didn't want you to do them, okay? But he's resetting. And when he says reset, he means bringing you to the original plan and destiny and hope and desire that he had for you when you were in your mother's womb. So the reset button has been hit. And you could, and, and any, nothing's too late, too over, too done, too cooked. None of that has happened. It's an opportunity to do everything that's in your heart because what's in your heart is in God's heart. Otherwise, you wouldn't have that going on. Terja, these will be the best years of your life. Unequivocally, I can't say that word, but you know what word I meant. The best. And there's a reset as well for your physical body. And I'm going to tell you something. Within a six-month period, you'll say, I have never felt this good in years. That's the type of reset in Jesus' name. Expect good. You're so worth it. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, Lala. Stand up. Would you all extend your hands towards her? We've known Lala since she was this itty-bitty little baby, baby. Baby Lala. We, yes, we knew her in the womb. <laughs> and we don't want to go too much further than that right now. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, want to, I want to speak 2015 as a year of change for you. Tremendous change, if you will allow it to be so. Because God has wanted to... Uh, Lala, I, I hope this makes sense to you. But to me... You've been sort of in, in a cage. And he's opened the gate, and you are free. And you are free to fly. And there is no limitation 
on how high you can go. There's no limitation at all. You have such a tremendous creative artistic side in you and you've carried a lot of things that have dampened that creativity and that artistic side and that is what is being removed so that you could really fly and really take off so I'm speaking that shift for you beginning in 2015 and for the next seven years you're going to see the fulfillment of your heart's desire personally. All the personal things, one right after another. Okay? And I just want you to know that uh, and whatever you need to do, God will make sure you have the resource, the financial resource to do it. If it's a specific trip that you want to take, plan it. God will make sure that you have an opportunity to do it. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, Miss, I'm going to Israel, girl. Facebook is such a good tool. Let us know what she's doing. I just want to extend hands to you. I know you're going to go to Israel. You wrote that down. You asked for advice, blah, blah, blah. But you know, I saw something in the spirit for you. Do you know before you get there in the natural, God's going to take you in the spirit? And when you get there, you will have the sense of, I've been here before and I've seen this before. So God is going to do something really supernatural in that realm for you. And I'm also supposed to speak a promotion for you. And I do, in the name of Jesus. That there's something um, that uh, your skill or your test has qualified you for. And that you're going to be promoted and qualified for more in, in your actual job. And I prophesy that into reality here in this realm in the name of Jesus. It'll come where you'll have to make a little bit of choice about some things to be with this promotion thing. Okay, so, but don't be scared because the cloud will go with you. Okay? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And for this brother right here, would you stand up? Would you come here? Would you lay hands on him? Go ahead and get out of your way. Um, you carry, he carries something very powerful in the spirit. And he knows how to worship God. And that's what I was recognizing and kept picking up from him tonight, particularly that that um, that that inheritance that it's like something has come to you from a previous generation and you have it now and so I just speak the fulfillment of that which uh, your family who have gone before you have called out on your behalf that it comes to pass in the name of Jesus and also for you there's a quickening of your physical body today tremendous healing virtue touches and quickens you physically from the top of your head to the ends of your toes things that have been painful things that have been out of order because of some hard life situations that have hurt your body you're healed in the name of Jesus and there's souls around here that you will help bring into the kingdom you really will and so we just bless you in that, in the name of Jesus. And we speak that over your life, in Jesus' name. Thank you. Yeah, a, real, a real call on your life is strengthen the body. Uh, strengthen the body of Christ. And, uh, boy, that, that, is, that is really an open-ended blessing of a, of a, of a edict. Thank you. <laughs> you know, Tricia, there was one other thing I forgot to say, and the Lord reminded me. Um, it was sort of like that scripture. Uh, Claudia read it tonight, and it, it said it was a scripture Paul spoke to Timothy, and he talked about um, his um, mom and his grandma. And I saw something like that over you 
but I saw you breaking out of something that maybe had been in your family, through in the women of your family, that maybe had come down that line with grandma and with your mom. You changed the course of it in the name of Jesus. And it goes a brand new way. You're the breaker in Jesus' name. And it's for you, Lala, and future generations. Olivia, future generations in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Okay. I'm done now. Oh, no, I'm not. Stand up. Lisa, Lisa would you lay hands on her, please? We speak real strength to you. Um, I, when you came in the door, I saw you, and my heart went out to you because it felt real hard, it, like just some real hard times. And um, you, it felt very, you felt very strange to me. So I speak emotional strength as well as physical strength because I think that there's some body areas that need to be touched. And so we speak healing for you in the name of Jesus, touched and healed in Jesus' name. And also, as Lisa is laying hands on you, um, she's imparting uh, a, a different job for you and a financial breakthrough in the name of Jesus because you really need that right now. That's part of the struggle. So we're speaking, we're speaking a change in that realm in the name of Jesus, a financial breakthrough in Jesus' name and just a rest for like your neck, your back, your like everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Lisa, did you have something you wanted to say? I could bring the mic to you. Okay. Patty, come on. I have something to say to Lala. When Mary was talking about this and giving you the word, um, I saw all of these people standing around like this vase on a pedestal, and it was very, very plain, and everybody kept saying, we don't know why this is so valuable. It looks so strange. It's just plain. We don't know. And then someone took a tuning fork and touched it and it broke apart and inside was the miracle. Inside was what was so very valuable and precious. When you were sitting there, I was, uh, the Lord was speaking to me and we just want you to know that uh, this year, he wants you to spend some time with him because there's some things he's going to show you personally. And uh, they're very cool things. Um, a lot of it has to do with a lot of the desire in your heart to see certain things in your life, to be with certain people. And God says, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to talk to you personally. You are going to have your own relationship with him that is deeper than what you know right now. And he, you will know him. At the end of this year, you will not be the same person that you are right now. Well, we're done. Did you want to come up and talk by it? Oh, Sunday I'm going to share some prophetic words for 2015 and and Jeff Jansen will be here next Friday Saturday and Sunday how many of you have ever heard of Jeff Jansen before he's awesome um, he moves in the realm of God's glory he has seen many miracles many unique kinds of miracles atmospheres change storms diverted um, you know just so many different things and uh, what's interesting about Jeff is that he asked if he could come here. So he asked a long time ago, and we've finally been able to work it out. He's had a vision of the church here, and uh, he believes that there's something about healing here that wants to be in residence. So please come. Please bring people. It's free to come. Jeff will be speaking on uh, fr next Friday night, which is the 9th. He'll be speaking on Saturday the 10th in the morning at 10 and at 7 in the evening and he'll be speaking on the 11th Sunday in the morning so one the following weekend not this weekend but next weekend please come and uh, let's see what God wants to do I know it'll be really exciting 
I know it's going to be something specific for New Mexico and Albuquerque and the greater part of the state as well because he seems to really have a heart to speak some things in. So please come if you can and tell other people. Is that all? It's free. It's free. You get to come for free. No registration fee, baby. Just bring yourself. And a nice love offering to give to Jeff. Okay? <laughs> okay. Well, we'll be having church again at 9.30 on Sunday. Come if you can. Uh, good night. Safe trip home. God bless you. Bye. <laughs>